Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. You know, it's not often that we get the opportunity to relive a part of our past, but this fall, I got together with an old football buddy, Jerry Kramer, to do a bit of pheasant hunting, something we hadn't done together since our college days at the University of Idaho. Now, we may be a little bit slower these days, and our knees have sustained some damage, but the pleasure of hunting in Idaho has not changed. Smart, and they start moving in there. But what we need to do is get the dogs over in the far corner of the field toward the uh, Russian olives in that uh, corn pit over there. Come on. Come on, Joining us on this perfect fall day are hunters Brent Kaywood and Dave Hull, and three very excited bird dogs named Buster, Cricket, and Tyson. Here, Tyson. There goes one. Tyson is a six-year-old German shorthair who obviously doesn't lack enthusiasm for the hunt. Come here. Uh, he's a little wild right now. <clears throat> it's hard for him to hunt this brush because he can't see or hear any of the commands in this taller brush. Hey, Tyson. For most sportsmen, the measure of a successful hunt is a magic blend of a good bird dog, good friends, and Idaho's great outdoors. So this is the first time Kramer and I have been in the field together since we were back in Moscow. We used to sometimes sneak out and get an hour or two of hunting in before we go to football practice in the afternoon. You know, the more I hunt these birds, the more I appreciate their intelligence and cunning instincts they have. You can walk by them, you know, Three yeah. feet, four feet. They'll double back on you within three feet of you. Turn around and go right back beside you. You know, I used to hunt. We didn't have a dog. We'd have to run them down if we knocked them down. Remember well, that? We could, we could run them down. <laughs> Those days, yeah. yeah. Today, it's the dogs who are doing the running. An adjacent cornfield looks promising, and Brent and Dave begin working the area with two of the dogs. There's one, Jer. Atta, baby. Good shot. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a big rooster. But I don't think of a rainbow. And every time I catch a big rainbow, I say, boy, what a beautiful thing. And every time I see a big rooster, I say, boy, what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful bird. Yeah. I'm always, always a little bit amazed, too, that such an exotic animal from China could do so well here in the Idaho for some reason. The ringneck pheasant is Idaho's most popular game bird. This exotic creature is actually a native of Asia and wasn't officially introduced into our state until 1903. The birds thrived in Idaho's farmlands and their numbers probably peaked during the years when Jerry and I were playing football for the University of Idaho in the 1950s. But the last few decades have seen a marked decline in the pheasant population. 20 years ago, my man, there was some incredible pheasant hunting out here. Yeah. It was so good, uh, I didn't know how good it was, you know. Sure, you just take it for granted, of, don't got, you? Got spoiled. The habitat has changed over the years. Farming methods have become more efficient, and as a result, less cover is available for pheasants to escape from predators or for hens to raise their young. Throw in a few blustery cold winters when this lack of protection makes them more vulnerable to the cold, and suddenly these beautiful birds are no longer a common sight. To combat this downward trend, two new programs were established in the late 1980s to help private landowners improve wildlife habitat on their property. In 1986, the federal government created the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP, the idea was to take highly erodible cropland, like this area in southeast Idaho, out of production for a 10-year period and seed it with grasses. Now, this corner of the state has become prime habitat for another popular game bird, the sharp-tailed grouse. A state program called the Habitat Improvement Program, or HIP, is funded by Idaho bird hunters through waterfowl and upland bird stamps. This money is used on a cost-sharing basis to restore lost habitats where landowners want to bring back the birds. Both the federal and state programs have generated results, but they could be in jeopardy. 
Conservation groups such as Pheasants Forever hope to encourage the United States Congress and the Idaho legislature to renew these two habitat programs so these quiet days of companionship will not become a thing of the past. Well, so yeah, it's been years since I've done this. You know, me and my dad used to hunt this country a lot when I was a kid. He, he could get after him. Yeah. I got his old gun. I'll show it to you yet. It's old. Looks like a Model 12. Remington, 12 gauge. A model 31, probably, I don't know, what do you think, late 40s maybe? For this classic, thing? Classic gun. Yeah. Right? Just a classic gun. I've seen a. A little heavier than I like right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, who would think, huh? 40 years later? Who would think we'd even be here, let alone <laughs> out chasing the, the birds still? One of so many choices you have. You know, I've done a bunch of them just in the last couple, three days. Do a little fishing, playing some golf, out here bird hunting. Can't do this stuff when you're working. <laughs> and who would think, after leaving the state to pursue careers in professional football, we would both find ourselves returning to our roots. I guess that's the magic of Idaho. I guess everybody is comfortable with their piece of the rock, you know, their part of the world. I think we're especially fortunate out here. This barbecue sauce has a lot of secret ingredients. Even my cooks don't know everything that goes into it. I mix part of it while I'm here in the mornings, and then they finish it off. We talk about the companionship the dogs and the chance to spend time in Idaho's outdoors, but there's an additional reward to a successful hunt, the makings for a delicious meal. Preparing wild game has become an art in itself, and everyone seems to have a favorite method. But we found a real winner, a place that makes your mouth water the second you walk through the door. He calls himself the barbecue king of Idaho, and it may be hard to dispute his claim. A former airline pilot, Dick Snow, spent his layover searching for the best barbecue spots in the country. When he retired from flying, he opened his own restaurant in Boise. It's a one-of-a-kind in Idaho, a custom-built barbecue pit from the barbecue capital of the world, Mesquite, Texas. And what Texas barbecue or southern barbecue is, is indirect heat. And so we build a fire back here, and through a system of flues, it goes into the to the barbecue pit, but the coals uh, never get close to the fire, and we use all the smoke and the heat from the, from the fire back here to cook the meat long and slow. Instead of a real high heat, it's a real low temperature cooking process. Now, remember those pheasants from the last story? Well, what could be finer than a holiday feast prepared by the barbecue king of Idaho, who also happens to be a hunter himself. What we have, yeah, pheasants are a little tricky because they're dry, and what you need is to try and pluck the pheasants instead of skinning the pheasants like a lot of hunters like to do. And that keeps a little bit of the fat in the bird in the smoking process because the smoker dries out the meat if you're not careful. What I'm gonna do is just mix all of the stuffing ingredients, and I've got some Granny Smith apples and some fresh parsley and some carrots and some diced onions. And we'll mix all this together with a little white wine, and we'll retain a little of the wine, which we'll pour over the birds right before they go in the barbecue pit. Uh, it's just after smoking a lot of birds for different hunters, we found out that this uh, makes, it, makes the bird taste real good. We'll throw it away before we eat. Uh, but this combination, or you can use a little celery, seems to work out real well and it uh, adds some moisture into keeps the bird moist while it's smoking. Once both birds are stuffed, Dick pours a little bit of the wine into the cavity and then it's time for the barbecue king's magic touch. And what I've done is mix up a little bit of barbecue sauce and what we're going to do is dip the bird in here and get it real well covered. This barbecue sauce has a lot of secret ingredients. Even my cooks don't know everything that goes into it. I mix part of it while I'm here in the mornings, and then they finish it off. And uh, it's just an old recipe that I brought up from Texas with me, and it seems to be real popular. Dick has done a lot of homework in the history of smoking and barbecuing, 
He says that the technique originated with African Americans as a result of the injustices of the past. Since the slaves were given the inferior, tougher cuts of meat, they conceived the process of slowly smoking it to make the meat more palatable. Along the way, it became popular with the slave owners as well, and a good barbecue man was coveted. All the, all the research, what I'm doing now is sprinkling a little lemon pepper on here, and that just adds a nice little tart flavor to it. And we're going to put these pheasants right here in the center. These will be ready in about four to six hours. And we cook at a real low temperature. And we'll rotate that around. Those look like they're going to do all right. And we'll close the pit up, we'll come back in about an hour and check them. While our pheasants are slowly cooking, Dick shows us how to make a peach cobbler, the perfect complement to his southern barbecue. And then what I've mixed together here is the ingredients. Uh, it's some flour, some lime juice, some nutmeg, some cinnamon, sugar, and we're going to mix all this together. So once this mixture is nice and in a liquid form like this, we'll go ahead and add these peaches. And we'll stir that up. And once you've got a good mixture on that, that goes right into the pan. And then we have a topping. Uh, some people like a pie crust topping. This is kind of a sweet cake topping, but it mixes through the peach cobbler. And so that's ready to go in the oven, and we cook that for about two hours at 325 degrees. And we'll cook that and have some of that with our meal. In the meantime, Dick arranges some delicious looking side dishes of wild rice and steamed broccoli. But the real story is the birds in the barbecue pit. These have been on for about five and a half hours now, and what we do with everything is check in the cavity to make sure the temperature's accurate. And it looks like we've got some cooked pheasants. After hours of anticipation, the time of reckoning has finally come. Dick serves the pheasants smoked to a golden brown with a Petros Cabernet Sauvignon. According to the wine merchant, full-bodied reds go best because smoked pheasant is a rich, hearty meat, and a wine should be chosen that doesn't fight that rich flavor, but rather complements it. The other nice thing about smoking meat is the, uh, the way we smoke and do it very slowly. It seals most of the natural juices in, so the exterior might be a little dry and it also cooks a lot of the fat out of the skin but the meat is incredibly moist and tender and that's why smoking it is so uh, popular and also uh, it's getting more and more popular because it's good and it's healthy it's fat free we cook it so long we cook almost all the fat right out of it it's hard to believe that something that smells this wonderful can actually be healthy but you heard it from idaho's own barbecue king so it must be true there is no doubt he's right about the flavor. It's incredible. Moist, tender, and absolutely delicious. And let's dig in. Merry Christmas. Uh, if our fertilization rates are good, uh, we may be uh, generating more than 300,000. Up to 95% of our juvenile salmon never make it beyond the eight Snake and Columbia River dams that block their journey to the ocean. But a glimmer of hope has appeared for Idaho's Chinook and Sockeye salmon. On December 14th, the Northwest Power Planning Council approved a plan recommending drawdowns of the water level behind the dams. Now this will allow faster travel for juvenile salmon migration and may be the first real step in preventing their extinction. Now, to most people, this is a dead fish. To me, this is the next generation of salmon. This is life for the river. Uh, whether the offspring of these fish get the nutrients or whether a bear gets it or a bird or anything else. This is the way nature intended it to end. Exhausted and spent, this adult Chinook salmon has spawned and died in one of Idaho's rivers. The salmon's rotting carcass will help restore nutrients into the stream, fertilizing the waters where its offspring will hatch next spring. We're watching these fish die, which is, I mean, that's a, a normal part of the life cycle. But what we're watching die is, is we're watching the species die. And we have control over that. 
uh, whether or not we exert that control and decide to save these fish is, is up to us. We have the power to correct the things that are wrong. For research biologist Dave Canamella, this story is a tragic rerun. He watched the demise and gradual extinction of the Atlantic salmon on the country's east coast, and he's passionate about preventing a similar tragedy here. Everybody in the Pacific Northwest, everybody in the country, stands accountable to the next generation and to the generation after that and to every generation from here on out because there's no turning back. If we lose these fish, you're looking at an evolutionary uh, miracle that's gone. We have no way to restore uh, Snake River Basin Chinook if they go away. The numbers are frightening. In 1962, almost 28,000 fall Chinook returned from the ocean destined for Idaho. Last fall, there were 800. Returning spring and summer Chinook have dropped from 65,000 in 1962 to less than 4,000. Sockeye numbers are even more alarming. Last fall, only one adult sockeye salmon returned to its birthplace in the Sawtooth Mountains. How do you begin to save a species when you're down to one fish? Well, yeah, and there's no question about it. We, you know, we, our, our whole m mandate here is to maintain the sockeye genetics until we can get improved migration and improved survival en route to the ocean. And we're hoping that'll be very soon. Fisheries biologist Keith Johnson is in charge of the captive breeding program at Idaho Fish and Game's Eagle Fish Hatchery. Since the sockeye salmon were declared endangered in 1991, biologists have been aggressively attempting to preserve a genetic pool of these fish by breeding them in captivity. These are Broodier 91 sockeye, which are the progeny of the single female that we got in 1991 that were spawned with three males. Uh, all of these fish are half brothers and sisters. So Those fish will be crossbred with wild sockeye that were born in Redfish Lake in the Sawtooth Mountains and then captured in this trap as they began their migration to the ocean. These are what biologists call out migrants. The tiny sockeye were transferred to the hatchery and raised to the huge adult fish you see here today. The idea is to mix the offspring of these two sources and come up with a diversity of genetics. To give you an idea of how complicated this becomes, listen to Keith explain the procedure in store for that single sockeye that returned from the ocean this fall. Once she's mature, then we'll be using, we'll divide the eggs into four groups, Three of the genetic types from the brood year 91 will be used, plus an out-migrant group, but not using out-migrant 92s because that should be the same year that she went out. Got that? Well, aside from the intricacies of genetics, the biologists are also sorting fish according to their sexual maturity, which can vary from day to day. What you feel for in a female is the, the distribution of the weight in the body cavity. Now, this, this female here is ready to spawn, and you can feel a, a real sponginess in the body cavity. Those that appear to be ready for spawning are put in separate tanks. The others are sent back to the ranks to grow up. Each of the sockeye has been injected with a tiny computer chip called a pit tag, or passive integrated transponder that tells the biologist the genetic background of the fish. As the sperm from each male is collected, it's placed in plastic bags marked with that particular sockeye's pit tag number. Each male is spawned five times over the course of a few weeks. But for the mature females, it's a quick death in order to collect every last egg. The eggs are taken with the aid of a process called air spawning that injects air into the abdomen and forces the eggs out. Now, this is where it becomes real complicated. The biologists keep a careful record of the pit tag numbers corresponding to each lot of sperm and eggs. Then, as the fertilized eggs are transferred from the plastic bags to a more permanent home in an incubator bucket, they're marked with the pit tag number of the mother on top and the father on the bottom. They will become fish about uh, 60 days, maybe 70 days from now if fertilization is successful. Keith Johnson is hoping to produce over 150,000 fish from these eggs. A good beginning, 
and maybe a step towards preserving this endangered species. But will it be enough? Well, I'd have a hard time working here if I didn't think that we could do it. Uh, the fish will do their part. Uh, there's no question about that. I think our mandate is to maintain the genetics of these fish uh, during this transition time while we get improvements in migration. If we get improvements in migration survival, certainly these fish will, uh, will restore. Our early snowfall this year has had a big effect on Idaho's wildlife. Those pheasants that escaped from Jerry and me this fall will probably hold up in the high grasses along the riverbank right now. And it could be critical for our salmon smolts. They may get an extra boost downstream next spring if these snows continue and we get a big runoff. But for the deer and elk of Idaho, it means an early journey to the more forgiving territory of lower elevations. As we close our show tonight, we leave you with images of winter and wildlife. Thanks for being with us.